Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this lecture series on the rules on evidence. We are under rule 130, part two. And this afternoon, we will discuss about the parole evidence rule. So let me share my screen. Rule 130, part two, parole evidence rule. What is parole evidence rule? It is any evidence, aliunde, or extrinsic evidence, which is intended or tends to vary or contradict a complete and enforceable agreement embodied in a document. It may refer to testimonial, real, or documentary evidence. So in other words, when you say parole evidence, it refers to evidence outside a written agreement. It can refer either to a verbal testimony. It can, be, it can refer to an object or another document. So when you say parole evidence, it is evidence outside the written agreement. What is the rationale? of parole evidence rule. First, it, it is to give stability to written, uh, written statements. So this is to give a premium to written agreements. So parole evidence rule will give stability to written ag agreements. Why? Because under parole, parole evidence rule, no evidence can be admitted except the written agreement itself. So if no evidence can be admitted except the written agreement itself, then it will give stability to that written agreement. Second rationale is to remove the temptation and possibility of perjury or the commission of uh, uh, lies and falsity or falsehood respecting the testimony of a person which will tend to change the terms of the written agreement. So in order to avoid the temptation or to remove the temptation and possibility of perjury, then you have the parole evidence rule. And lastly, to prevent possible fraud, which is very much similar to the second rationale. Now, what are the different kinds of ambiguities under the parole evidence rule? Now, again, I will repeat. Under parole evidence rule, evidence aliunde or extrinsic evidence. When you say extrinsic, extrinsic, it is outside. It is evidence outside a written agreement. No? So no evidence can be admitted except the written agreement itself. There are different kinds of ambiguities. First is intrinsic or latent. Second is extrinsic or patent. And third, intermediate. Let us distinguish one from the other. An intrinsic ambiguity is an ambiguity on the face of the written agreement. The writing appears clear and unambiguous, but there are collateral matters which can make the meaning uncertain. So in intrinsic or latent ambiguity, the ambiguity is inside the written agreement. It is on the face of the written agreement. Okay, But what will make the written agreement um, uh, uh, ambiguous is are collateral matters, meaning matters on the side, which makes the meaning uncertain. Now, intrinsic or latent ambiguity can be cured by outside evidence. You can introduce evidence in order to, to aid the interpretation of the written agreement. Now, second is extrinsic or patent ambiguity. An extrinsic or patent ambiguity is ambiguity which is apparent on the face of the writing and requires that something be added to make the meaning certain. Now, if the ambiguity 
consists of extrinsic or patent, it cannot be cured by extrinsic evidence or evidence alunde. What about intermediate ambiguity? In intermediate ambiguity, the ambiguity consists in the use of equivocal words susceptible of two or more interpretations. No? So the words used are not clear. It is not specific. And so there is an ambiguous interpretation. Now, if the ambiguity consists of use of equivocal word, then you call that ambiguity as intermediate. Now, in intermediate ambiguity, this can be cured by evidence aliunde, or again, evidence outside the written agreement. So there are two kinds of ambiguity to which you can present an extrinsic evidence. That is first, intrinsic or latent ambiguity, and second, intermediate ambiguity. Now, there is a Latin saying that falsa demonstratio non nisse cum de corpore constat. That Latin phrase literally means an erroneous description does not spoil the act. It states that the false description does not injure or vitiate a document if the subject is sufficiently identified. The incorrect description shall be rejected as a surplusage, while the correct and complete description standing alone shall sustain the validity of the writing. Parole evidence is admissible to prove mistake in the execution of a written instrument. Now, let us go to the different requisites for the application of parole evidence rule. First, there must be a valid contract. So parole evidence class, the parole evidence rule, or the rule that prohibits the introduction of evidence aliunde, now applies only if the contract is valid. If the contract is not valid, then you do not apply parole evidence rule, meaning extrinsic evidence can be introduced. Second, the terms of their agreement must be reduced to writing. Parole evidence apply only to written agreements, so much so that oral agreement or verbal agreement no, finds uh, uh, the parole evidence rule rather does not find application to an oral or verbal agreement. Third, the dispute is between the parties or their successors and in interests. So the prohibition to present extrinsic evidence or evidence outside the written agreement will bind only the contracting parties. Persons or third persons who are not parties to the contract can present extrinsic evidence because they are not bound by parole evidence rule. And the last requisite is that there is a dispute as to the terms of the agreement. Evidence of written agreements. When the terms of an agreement have been reduced to writing, it is considered as containing all the terms agreed upon, and there can be between the parties and their successors in interest no evidence of such terms other than the contents of the written agreement. This is actually the definition of parole evidence rule under the rules of court. In other words, that's, this is a very long sentence, but if you reduce it into the simplest term, it just means that no evidence outside the written agreement can be presented in court. If an agreement has been reduced to writing, that written agreement is the only evidence that can be presented to establish the terms as agreed upon by the parties. Now, that is only the general rule. A party may present evidence to modify, explain, or add to the terms of the written agreement if he puts an issue in his pleadings the following. So you need to put in the pleadings the following issue. Number one, that there is an intrinsic ambiguity 
mistake or imperfection in the written agreement. So in cases that there is a mistake in the written agreement, you can present evidence outside the agreement in order to prove that mistake. That is what we mean by that. The second exception is when there is a failure by the written agreement to express the true intent of the parties there too. So for example, the parties intended to enter into a contract of loan, but what they have entered into is an investment contract. In that case, since the parties have executed the wrong form of the contract, then evidence outside the wrongful ex wrongfully executed contract can be presented in order to express the true intention of the parties. Third, if the issue is validity of the written agreement. If the written agreement has a, an issue regarding its validity, then you can present extrinsic evidence. Fourth, existence of other terms agreed, by, agreed to by the parties or their successors in interest after the execution of the written agreement. So if there are some other terms agreed upon by the parties after the written agreement was executed, then extrinsic evidence can be presented. Okay. Now, let us distinguish between parole evidence rule and best evidence rule. Okay. Parole evidence rule presupposes that the original document is available in court, while in best evidence rule, the original document is not available or that there is a dispute as to whether a said document or said writing is original. Under parole evidence rule, uh, it prohibits the varying of the terms of written agreement, while best evidence rule prohibits the introduction of secondary evidence in lieu of the original document, regardless of whether or not it varies the contents of the original. Okay. Parole evidence rule applies only to documents which are contractual in nature except wills. And best evidence rule applies to all kinds of writing, whether it is whether there is a contract or not. Parole evidence rule can be invoked only when the controversy is between the parties, so the written agreement, their successors in interest, their previous, or any party affected thereby, like, like assessed to be a trust. On the other hand, best evidence rule can be invoked by any party, practically not only the parties to the contract or the document. So any party can invoke the best evidence rule. If the original document is not presented, then you can invoke the best evidence rule. And so it will prohibit the introduction of document other than the original. Let us go to interpretation of documents. This is rather an easy rule or section. Okay, what are the rules in interpreting documents? One, the language of a writing is to be interpreted according to the legal meaning it bears in the place of its execution, unless the parties intended otherwise. So the language of the contract or the document will be interpreted according to the legal meaning of the place where the contract was executed. Very easy. Second, when there are several provisions or particulars, such a construction is, if possible, to be, to be adopted as will give effect to all provisions. Third, the intention of the parties is to be pursued. When a general and a particular provision are inconsistent, the latter, the particular provision, is paramount to the former. So general versus particular provision, the latter will prevail. So a particular intent will control a general one that is an inconsistent with it. The circumstances under which it was made, including the situation of the subject thereof and of the parties to it, may be shown so that the judge may be placed in the position of those whose language he is to interpret. The terms of the writing are presumed to have been used in their primary and general acceptation. 
but evidence is admissible to show that they have a local, technical, or otherwise peculiar signification and were so used or un and understood in a particular instance, in which case the agreement must be construed accordingly. When an instrument consists partly of written words and partly of printed form, and two are inconsistent, the printed form controls, or rather, the written words controls the printed form. Okay, when the characters in which an instrument is written are difficult to be deciphered or the language is not understood by the court, the evidence of persons skilled in deciphering the characters or who understand the language is admissible to declare the characters or the meaning of the language. Okay, so these are just uh, some of the rules in interpretation. Okay, for number eight, when the terms of an agreement have been intended in a different sense by the different parties to it, that sense is to prevail against either party in which he is to post the other understood it. And when, the diff and when different constructions of a provision are otherwise equally proper, that is to be taken which is, more, which is most favorable to the party in whose favor the provision was made. When an instrument is equally susceptible of two interpretation, interpretations, one in favor of natural right and the other against it, the former is to be adopted. An instrument may be construed according to usage in order to determine its character. Thank you for listening and I'll see you again next meeting.